Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled People Stories. Our first story we'll be reading today. Unemployed Karen and her husband expect me to pay for her meals. After that, am I the jerk for not letting my daughter have locks on her room? And after that, sure, I'd love to convert a 10-minute task into a 3-day project. Now for every thumbs up this video gets, one Karen has to pay for her own meals. Not like you could pay for them in the first place, broke boy. So please smash that like button and subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. Unemployed Karen and her husband expect me to pay for her meals. I, 28 male, have two friends, D, who's 27 female, and Tommy, who's 29 male. We've known each other since middle school and we make it a point to make time to keep in touch and we go out to eat at least once a month, but often twice a month. We live a 40 minute drive apart, but it's worth it to keep the friendship alive. This has slowed down during lockdown, but we're back at it again semi-regularly. I'm single and aromantic. They've never made me feel like a third wheel, and this isn't a date that I'm invading. It's decompression time for friends to have a nice meal and maybe a few drinks. After the lockdown, Dee never went back to working. They both seem to be okay with this, and she enjoys the housemaking life. That's their thing, not my problem. The problem is that when the bill comes, Tommy asks for it to be split two ways, or it will just be split that way because only two of us walked up to the pay counter. The first few times I just shrugged it off. Half of her meal comes to less than $7 and I usually have a singular beer while they have soda, so my portion is probably $2 to $3 higher anyways. It all came to a head this weekend when we went to a nicer place that just opened in the area. At $50-ish dollars a head, I couldn't help but speak up when he tried to tell the waitress to split the bill two ways. I did the math at the table and just what I had came up to $67. A third of the total bill was $71. I told him I'd either pay a third, even though it's more than my portion, or just go Dutch. I didn't care either way since it was close. He was absolutely appalled, told me it was embarrassing that I had done all this in front of Dee knowing that she wasn't working, and made a snide remark about how I make more than him anyways. To his snide remark, I said something I maybe shouldn't have about the fact that I'm not the one who married her, so why should I subsidize her unless she's coming home with me half the time? I paid my portion and left. Now he's texting me incessantly about how I embarrassed him in front of his wife and that I should have been a man about the situation and split the bill between the men like it's proper to do. The more I think back, the more I realize this has happened since college too. He and I would split the cost for pizza and she would come eat too. You can call me the jerk for what I said. I'll accept that. But am I the jerk for settling the bill in front of her? She's known me for as long as he has. Maybe I should have just paid for it then and settled it later. You're the jerk for that comment. Those kinds of things are not appropriate and you kind of let yourself get taken advantage of here. Insist on three-way for all future outings, if there are any. You're the jerk. If I was him, I would have secretly whipped out my phone and asked you to repeat that. I'd record you and post it online to show the world what a vile jerk you are. You can bet I'd be showing it to your workplace too, in person. If you're this kind of a person to your friends, I can only imagine how you act with coworkers. I hope they never give you another chance at being friends again. You are the most disrespectful person I've seen on here in a long time. You're the jerk. That comment was so completely vile it outweighs whatever high ground you had. Seriously disgusting. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his friends? Please let us know. Never stay friends with people who feel entitled to your money. Am I the jerk for not letting my daughter have locks on her room? I'm 43, female. My daughter, Lara, who's 17, has been struggling to focus on her studies with her brothers Kyle, who's 12, and Ryan, who's 9, constantly disrespecting her privacy. A few days ago, she was yelling for Kyle to come to her room. I asked what had happened. She explained that Kyle flipped all of her items upside down. I called Kyle to come up and flip everything right side up. Yesterday, Ryan was running around her room and kept stealing her stuff while she ran to get them back. On the night of the same day, Lara was trying to sleep when the brothers suddenly barged in and ran through it, resulting in her screaming at them to stay out and close the door while she was sleeping, to give a few examples. Today in the morning, her father, who's 48, told her he didn't like the way she was screaming. She said that she was trying to sleep and her brothers were making all kinds of ruckus. He told her that they're kids and they will learn eventually. She said that they will never learn and the only way for them to learn is to have locks installed for her room. He did not want her to 
and they went back and forth on this until she threatened she would move out as soon as she became financially independent since she wasn't going to wait for them to mature and they should already know to respect her privacy, to which he said to wait to include me in the conversation. I overheard, and when she went to her room, I told her she wasn't going to have locks set up, because she already wastes her time without the need for locks, and I don't want her to fail. Lara said that they were never going to listen without them, and I told her that I would make sure they wouldn't enter her room. This evening, I heard her shouting for me. We were all in the living room. Her father explained what was going on, Lara said that she was making Kyle tea when he did what he's not allowed to do, and he said that if she promises to not tell, he and Ryan will never go into her room again. She didn't say anything, so they ran upstairs to her room. I told her that she has no right to complain since she always sleeps in Kyle's room after school. Her brothers all agree, and Lara calls all of us the worst. None of us are allowed in her room and leaves. She comes back after a minute and says that she only sleeps in Kyle's room because he never uses it, aside from sleeping at night, and if he was to use it for studying, then she would never go in there. Meanwhile, they constantly disturb her, mess with her stuff, and made her unable to sleep just last night. I told her if they ever go into her room, she needs to come to me. Then Kyle starts saying that they had the right to go into her room while she was trying to sleep because they were playing. Lara yelled at him, then said that she couldn't wait to move out soon so she no longer has to deal with them. She also called me an awful mother for not giving her her bedroom locks. You're the jerk. What exactly are you doing to stop your sons from acting like jerks? They wreck her room, ignore her right to privacy, and barge in when she's sleeping. What exactly have you done to impress on your sons that this behavior is not acceptable? They're old enough to know better, so why don't they? You're the jerk. A 17-year-old deserves privacy. Why is your inability to keep your younger kids under control her problem? Either get her a lock or parent your sons. Don't expect to have a relationship with her after she gets out. Why on earth are you allowing your kids to act like that? Messing with their sister's things and disrupting her study time is bad enough. Running through the room while she's sleeping is even worse. You're the jerk for allowing this bad behavior and not getting a lock. My parents put a lock on my door when I was nine to keep my younger siblings out of my private space because they respected me enough to not allow my belongings to be destroyed by their kids. You're the jerk. My brothers did the same thing when I was growing up. Luckily for me, they were highly allergic to peanuts. After I snuck a bit of peanut butter in their food a few times and a few trips to the ER, they finally learned to stay away from me. Your sons sound like total brats and you and your husband are sorry excuses for parents. Well, what do you think? Should OP let her daughter have a lock on her room or not? Please let us know. Absolutely, and they should start parenting those boys. Am I the jerk for kicking out a guy that gave me the silent treatment in my own home? I'm part of a large friend group. We're in our late 20s to early 30s. The majority of the time, we hang out at my place, the launch pad. My place was chosen because I have a pool, an apartment pool. I'm not that fancy. It's pretty central, and it has the biggest kitchen, so it's where we usually decide to do the group's cooking. I would say that usually 8 to 12 people come to most things, and the core group is maybe like 20 of us, all dating back to college. There are a few people in the group I don't get along that well with, but whatever, they're part of the group. I still invite them. However, last night, Saturday night, something weird happened. One of the people who doesn't like me much, Jordan, was acting like a space case and wasn't responding to anything I said. It actually led to him burning the group's nachos because he ignored my directions to take them out of the oven. The fire alarm went off and everything. I found out through another group member that Jordan decided he's not going to acknowledge my existence anymore because he doesn't like me. To be clear, Jordan and I have never had any kind of argument or fight. I asked Jordan if this was the case and he wouldn't even respond. This man had the gall to come to my home as a guest, cook food in my kitchen, nearly cause a fire, and then refuse to speak to me. I told Jordan to get out of my apartment if he wasn't willing to speak to me in my own home. Jordan, to his credit, complied and left immediately, grinning smugly like a Cheshire cat after filling my place with burnt nacho smoke. Jordan's good friend, Amber, who isn't my biggest fan either apparently, said I was being a controlling jerk and also left with him. I also booted Jordan out of the Launchpad group chat, which has sparked a serious controversy among my friends because it's where all the group planning for my place takes place. Anyway, it's escalated and the group is split. Half of our friends seem to think it's fine that I removed Jordan, both IRL from my house and from the launch pad chat, because he was at my house and refusing to even interact. 
The other half think that Jordan is a long-standing group member and I should just put up with him ignoring me and continue to invite him even if he doesn't like me because he's been part of the group a long time and he didn't choose my house as the home base. So I'm wondering, am I the jerk for booting someone that won't speak to me from my own house when I'm the central hub for our friends? Not the jerk. Is Jordan 12? The silent treatment without explanation? Forget him. You don't have to put up with people who treat you like that in your own home. I get that group dynamics can be tough, but a modicum of decency towards the host shouldn't be too much to ask. If others don't like it, maybe suggest rotating meetup places. It might be nice for you to be able to relax and not host all the time. OP Well, I just got off the phone and I think I have the answer as to why Jordan hates me so much. It's because people from the group give me money and he doesn't understand why they do it. He just sees people in the group giving me money on a regular basis. What the man doesn't seem to get, and has now been explained to him, is the reason they're giving me money is because they're being polite guests who reimburse me for the crap they're constantly using at my home. Food, drinks, paper towels, toilet paper, extra electricity for all the cooking and extra people. All the extra laundry loads of towels, extra loads of sheets, people showering off after the pool, you name it. Jordan has never done this that I can remember, but I'll be honest, I don't really keep track. People are generous and it mostly balances out. I end up buying a lot of stuff in bulk for the group that's pretty much covered by donations plus some extra. The extra, if there is any, goes towards the utilities bill as it's about twice what it should be. This is something Jordan was apparently completely unaware of. Jordan thought people were bribing me. I would laugh if it wasn't so annoyingly blowing up my life right now. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or Jordan? Please let us know. Friends are so overrated. My only friends are dead presidents, bruh. Skirt, skirt. Entitled hockey parents, bad parking, and nearly instant karma. This happened over 20 years ago now, sometime in the winter of 2001 and 2002, when I was working at the front desk of a large hotel. The hotel was a block from a large event center, which made it popular for anyone going to an event at the center. It's one of the incidents that will always stick with me as an example of karma getting the jerk. There was a large youth ice hockey tournament going on, and we had a long weekend filled with families and their lovely ice hockey kids that had traveled from all over the Midwest and Intermountain West to attend. Over 80% of our 300-ish rooms were filled with people for this event. Our parking lot was already too small for the hotel, and so we had to remind guests that if they couldn't find parking in our lot, that they could use the parking lot across the street. At first, we didn't think we needed to point out all the signs about not parking on unpaved areas. Evening before the tournament, all as well as it can be, sans the expected gangs of kids running up and down the hallway and riding the elevators at all hours, but we expect that. Parents were generally behaving at this point as well. Example, none of the typical adulterous antics that come with these groups. I got some juicy ones later to post. During the day, the next day, it's mostly quiet, with some groups coming in and out to rest when they had longer times between matches. No biggie, until it started to snow, and it snowed hard. We normally get snow, but it generally doesn't stick around long unless it isn't getting any sun, and typically not more than just a few inches. We got about a foot and had massive drifts throughout the lot. This is where the fun begins. What started as slightly not enough parking spaces turned into a massive short of spaces as no one could see the lines in the lot, and people with SUVs and four-wheel drive think they can do anything and park anywhere. And these were the vehicles of choice for hockey families lugging around thousands of dollars in gear. Not many sports kids can participate in that can be much more expensive than hockey, unless it involves horses. People are parked so poorly we can't get a plow through our lot and are actively directing people to park in the plowed and flat lot across the street, even offering our shuttle to carry equipment across the street. Of course they don't, and by the time everyone is somewhat settling in for the night, our parking lot looks like a snow tornado went through it, with vehicles parked pretty much wherever they wanted. Our maintenance manager clocked out and then came back in a few minutes later, telling us there were vehicles parked on the grass, one lifted vehicle over a hydrant, and half a dozen on the pond behind the hotel, but on our property. As I mentioned, snow doesn't stick around all winter. Neither does ice, and you couldn't pay me to walk across that pond in winter. How it was holding up, not one, but multiple vehicles, was nothing short of magic. And even in the snow and drifts, there's plenty of signage and a bridge that goes over part of it. You can't not know there's a body of water there. We called the night manager to the front, who had been patrolling the halls because of parent drama. Someone fancies someone else, but they are both married and they got caught. 
and he hears the maintenance manager's report, looks at us and says, tow them. I can't say I didn't take pleasure in calling the tow trucks after all the attitude we got telling people to park across the street. Between those parked on the pond, over hydrants, and in well-marked no-parking zones, 22 vehicles were towed. There were plenty of other vehicles that could have been towed, but only the ones that were in a dangerous situation or could get us fined, like blocking fire zones, got towed. I clocked out at 11 p.m. and went home to sleep, and I'm back at 8 a.m. for the morning shift. No kindness in these swing-slash-morning schedules. All is relatively quiet at first, until the hockey family start to head over to the event center for the day, around 9 a.m., and then we had 22 rooms with over-the-top angry guests. Our VP, whose office was just behind the front desk, grilled the two of us that had been there the evening before, and we reiterated that not only was it the night manager's instructions, but that there were vehicles on the pond, and we'd have been in a lot more trouble if it broke in the morning sun and someone got hurt. We got a blank stare for a moment from him. I don't think it ever occurred to him that a vehicle could drive all the way out onto the pond, before he shook his head and came up to the desk to back us up. He loudly reiterated what us at the front desk were saying, that there was clear signage of where to park and they chose to go off-roading and park in dangerous and illegal places. We handed out the information of the tow yard to those who had their vehicles towed, called a handful of cabs. Our shuttle driver ended up dropping a few of them off who were actually nice and apologetic to the tow yard on their way to pick up an airline's crew and we called and gave the tow yard a heads up that they might want backup. Then Mr. Jerkface came to give us a grilling. He and his wife and prodigy son were staying in our presidential suite and how dare we tow his $100,000 top of the line SUV from the center of the pond no less and if there was so much as a scratch on it he would personally sue each of us and how big of a mistake he made to have not stayed in the historic five-star hotel down the road where they knew how to treat his type of people. He demanded a refund for his room's night, to which our VP firmly refused and told him if he could find a room elsewhere, he was welcome to do so. That wasn't going to happen. Everyone was booked solid. He eventually left the desk and the next couple hours had a few other complaints, but mainly those getting their vehicles back sheepishly sulking back into the hotel while it's $120 lighter. And then noon hit. Of course, our VP went to lunch just prior, and Mr. Jerkface literally threw open our sliding entrance doors when they did not open for him quick enough and stomped straight towards us gals at the desk. One of our guest service guys popped out and stood between him and us because he was convinced he was going to jump the desk and attack us. Mr. Jerkface couldn't get his $100,000 top of the line SUV back because the police had confiscated it. We're half amused at the karma this guy is incurring, but also half terrified, thinking he might be a mobster or something. His wife was trying to calm him down and get him to go back to the room and then go back to the hockey game. His kid, who I did genuinely feel sorry for, was watching this tirade looking dumbstruck, holding some of his hockey gear. Another of the front desk gals went into the back and called the police, because honestly, we did not feel safe. She came back out, what seemed to be too quickly, and whispered to me, they're already here. I turn my head and three cops come walking in our front door and directly for Mr. Jerkface. Mr. Jerkface still doesn't seem to get it at this point and turns to the officers and starts losing it on them for having no right to confiscate his vehicle, how they don't know how to do their jobs, etc. And then the handcuffs came out. Just a note to clarify, we were at a large hotel with a bar, restaurant, convention halls that could hold a couple thousand in total and our PBX had its own dedicated little button to our city's dispatch. When she had gone back, the dispatch line was lighting up already to give us the heads up that police were incoming for a guest. Mr. Jerkface got arrested in front of his wife and kid in the middle of our lobby, but it seemed like they'd just walk him out. He was already a bit belligerent with the officers though, and then one of the cops said something to him, in which he spit and shouted in the officer's face, That jerk won't get a dime! At which point, he was then roughly taken out of the hotel, and the wife and kid scurried off. Our VP was concerned the credit card would end up with a chargeback, but it never did, and honestly, the rest of the tournament was quiet. I think word of what happened spread and scared everyone straight for the last day. At checkout two days later, one of the refs for the tournament was paying for his incidentals as his room had been paid for by the event and said, for voucher for breakfast, I'll tell you what happened. I've never seen our desk manager sign a voucher so fast. She had been away the tow day and the aftermath day but still wanted to hear all the gossip. Ref was older and had been around a while and knew the whole story. Mr. Jerkface was well known among the hockey tournament officials for being that guy, 
flaunting his money, causing drama. Huge hockey jerk. He had another family with four kids, one boy and three girls. The boy was injured when he was just starting to play hockey at the age of six or seven, and whatever happened, he couldn't play hockey anymore. Mr. Jerkface had attacked the parent of the player who had crashed into his son instead of accompanying him in the ambulance to the hospital. It was a big, memorable scene, much like the one we experienced. So what did Mr. Jerkface do? He left his family, filed for divorce, and pretty much just ignored that they ever existed. Got remarried a few months later and quickly popped out a son who he had on ice by kindergarten. The boy is 10 now. Ref overheard the wife crying to some of the other moms that he was arrested for the combination of owing nearly $500,000 in back child support and some other unspecified financial crimes. Basically, hiding his money to avoid paying his first family child support. Dude was literally living the high life with his replacement kid and wife. Apparently, his vehicle getting towed set off the flag that this guy could be found and taken in. And we got a little follow-up. A few weeks later, after a fight in our bar, one of the arresting cops had returned. We asked him if it was true, what Mr. Jerkface was arrested for. He told us he can't comment on specifics, but that sometimes judges like to set the bail for the egregious child support evaders, the ones who have it but are probably hiding it, at the amount of their back owed child support. And really big support is going to make the news wherever he was sent off to. We all remembered where he was from and didn't take us long to find the article about the guy with a half million dollar bail over child support, only to get immediately arrested again after he bonded out by the feds. To this day, I still think about how if he had just listened to directions, how differently it would have turned out for him. Love it when karma catches up to a person. Wondered why my local coffee shop was low staffed. Now I know why. I, 19 male, decided to quit my job and decided I wanted to work as a barista. So I started looking and found a good reviewed coffee shop close to my home. They were hiring, which I found odd, considering it's a very good looking shop that they got going. So I went in and met the owner. She gave me an interview and it went smoothly. Moving forward, first day on the job, they don't have a training course for newcomers like me who have absolutely no clue about coffee or the equipment. So the employees made me work on grinding espresso, making shots, crema, etc. It all went well. They were super nice to me throughout the process, grateful for it. So I wrote down everything they told me and watched. Second day, I did everything that I was taught to opening the lights, cleaning windows, cleaning tables, opening the cash register and counting the money in it, and opening the espresso machine, grinder, kettle, etc. I did it all correctly. It was just me and the owner because the employee that taught me yesterday had to get a surgery. Owner asked what I was taught yesterday, so I told her. She goes, that's it? I was a bit irritated by the way she said it. I thought I learned pretty well for a first timer, but boy, was I about to be in for a wild ride. Customer walks in and asks for a cappuccino. So I did like any first timer would do, pull out my trusty note and measure. But no, she said put it back and scolds me for not remembering. And for the whole entire day, she treats me like I'm a jerk for not knowing what I was doing. When I asked her to teach me the things I don't know, she was irritated. I was miserable. Sure, the employee taught me, but they didn't teach me everything. Third day, unsettling feelings start to come, but thankfully the owner wasn't there. Same routine goes, and I meet another employee, super nice and informative. And when I asked them questions, she would answer them instantly without hesitation and with pride. Customer came in and asked for a different extraction method, which I wasn't good at, and she knew that, so she told me to do the cash register. Everything goes buttery smooth, and when I pulled out my note to measure, she didn't judge me for it because we would remember things as we go. Fourth day, come to work early as I usually do to start my routine. I do everything they taught me. Owner walks in, my whole mood changed instantly. She asked me if I did my routine. I'm always an honest guy, so I told her yes. Doesn't believe me. Big Dumbo treatment comes. Scolding, scolding, scolding. I was miserable the entire day. She sees that I'm miserable and comes up to me and says, you're not gonna quit on us, are you? After saying that, she would walk back to where she came from and gossip, giggle right in front of my face. Like I could hear them talking about me. I've never had a problem with the customers or the employees. They're all so kind. But my problem is the boss. What should I do, guys? Is it my fault? What did I do wrong to deserve this? 
I wake up at 5 a.m. every morning to open her shop. Clean, open, prepare espressos like they told me to. Edit. I never lied in the interview about how I knew how to make coffee. I was honest throughout the interview about how I don't know anything about coffee or the equipment needed to make it because I needed them to teach me the things I don't know and not just stand there like some jerk that watches other people do the work. Am I the jerk for buying my girlfriend fake perfume? I, 23, male, have dated my girlfriend, 19, female, for a little under a year now. I've come to love her a lot and my love language is gift giving. My girlfriend has always been the type of girl that's just hard not to love. She's the definition of magnetic. Guys always approach her and understandably, she's a high caliber girl. She could easily be anyone's dream girl. Looks amazing and everything about her is feminine, down to her hands and how she comforts me or makes me food. She has an expensive look to her, but she does all her self care herself and is amazingly cost efficient about it. As a result, the kind of guys that go after her are usually trust fund babies or are highly ambitious, med school, law school, business startups, things like that, despite herself not being anywhere in that tax bracket. This isn't her fault because I've seen myself that she never entertains anyone but she just has that effect on people. It makes me feel like less of a man because I'm nothing like those guys and honestly, it makes me feel like a bum. One day while walking past her computer, I noticed that she was looking at a designer perfume and I told her I'll get it for her. She's adamant that she doesn't want me to get it for her and that she was just kind of daydreaming about it. She's literally never asked me for anything, but I wanted to show her that I can take care of her and spoil her too. I look into it and the perfume is $300. What the heck? I don't see the point in something like that, but honestly, my pride would be hurt if I went back on my word. So I find the perfume for a much greater value on eBay. Today comes and I gift her the perfume. She unwraps the present, sprays it on her hand to smell it, and her face is a blank expression, like she's trying to decide how to react. I ask her what's wrong and she gives me a hug and a kiss on the cheek, thanking me that I wanted to get her something nice. I don't know why, but it made me feel like crap. I was expecting a much bigger reaction. I keep pushing her as to why it seems like she doesn't like her gift and she tells me that she loves the idea, but it's obviously fake. I feel like this was an extremely ungrateful thing to say and I called her a brat for even caring if the perfume is fake or not. I also said that she's materialistic due to the fact that she could supposedly even tell it was fake by merely looking at it and smelling it once. She says that it's dumb that I made a big show about getting it for her if I was just going to do this and that what I got her is nothing like the original perfume, that it couldn't even be considered an imitation. I think it shouldn't matter, because I practically still got her the perfume she wanted, I just didn't drop $300 for it. This is making me see her in a different light. So Reddit, am I the jerk? Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his girlfriend? Please let us know. If Reddit boy got me a fake perfume, he'd need a new head. I expect my rules to be followed. Wait. Not like that. I worked in the clothes section of our store and it was not uncommon for staff and customers to ask fitting room staff to put clothes on hold for them by putting them in the back of the fitting room cupboard. All holds had to be picked up within two days or they'd be put back on the shelf, but everyone felt this was quite reasonable. A couple of months before Christmas, the department manager, for some reason, suddenly decided that staff were not allowed to put clothes on hold at all even if it was just for a few hours until you finished your shift and could go to the registers. Nope. If manager saw clothes put aside for a staff member, she'd take it and screech, I expect my rules to be followed. And, No clothes ought to be left in this cupboard. And go and put the clothing back on the shelf. She even printed out a note that said, Staff are not to put items on hold. No exceptions. Yes, that was even how she spelled it and stuck it inside the cupboard door where holes would have been kept. No justification was ever given for this rule. It wasn't like the staff holes were taking up space, as there would generally be no more than one to two items on hold for staff at any given time, if that. Also, when she pulled a staff member's hold items out of the cupboard, she would always rip it out as if she was trying to start a lawnmower, knocking several other items of clothing onto the floor and she'd always just flounce out without tidying up any of the mess she'd caused. Fast forward to maybe two weeks before Christmas. I was working in the fitting rooms on the evening shift 
and manager walked in while I was on the phone with a customer, maybe 10 minutes before closing time. As I watched, manager put two pairs of women's pajamas into the cupboard. However, instead of just putting them into the cupboard where there was a gap, she pulled the few remaining returns forward and pushed these pajamas right to the back of the cupboard. I watched her do it. She saw me watching, but neither of us said anything. As a hardworking employee, I knew that I had to make sure the cupboard was empty of returns before I left for the night, so that whoever was working in the morning would have a clean start. So as soon as I got off the phone, I took all the clothes out of the cupboard, put them all back out on the shelf, and went and clocked out to go home. My following shift, I got screamed at for putting the pajamas back out on the shelf because they were for my mother's Christmas present, and saying that she was going to make me call her mother and force me to explain why she wasn't getting the pajamas she wanted. I said, fine, I'll explain that she doesn't get her pajamas because of your rules. Manager said, but I'm a manager. You saw me put them in there, so you should have just left them. Without saying a word, I swung the cupboard door open and tapped the no exceptions bit on her sign. She was absolutely fuming, but there were customers and other staff there, and she realized that she didn't have a leg to stand on and would only look stupid if she pushed it further. So she just stormed out. The fallout, if you could call it that, was that she sulked and basically wouldn't talk to me for about three weeks. But given that when she did talk to me, it was usually to micromanage me or tell me to do something I was literally already doing, example, hurry up and clean the fitting room stalls, as I was already sweeping up rubbish in there with a dustpan. I was quite happy with that. On a side note, some staff did try getting around this rule by putting stuff in the cupboard with no name on it, but that made it hard for other fitting room staff as we couldn't tell what was a staff hold and what was just returns that needed to be put away. Others tried writing fake customer names, but the manager caught someone doing this and started putting away clothes with a customer name on it because she wasn't going to let anyone get away with it. On more than one occasion, it turned out that she put away something that was actually on hold for a customer, and then us fitting room staff would get shouted at for it. A lot of us evening and night workers couldn't even go and quickly buy the clothes we wanted on our breaks because we worked short shifts and either didn't get a break or only got 15 minutes and the registers were so busy and understaffed that there was no way you'd even get to check out in under 20 minutes. By the time our shift finished, the registers were closed. Support our channel by joining as a member today and we'll give you a shout out in our next video. Or come watch this video next. You won't believe what Karen does in that one.